Hello, we're on the run up to the great feast of Corpus Christi when the church traditionally gives thanks for the gift of the Eucharist and all that that means to us. And Father Chris and I were very uncertain about how we might mark that in these rather strange days when we can't even celebrate the Eucharist and share in the Eucharist in the traditional way. Um, and it then occurred to us that maybe one of the things we could do would be to extend the conversations that we have been having over the last few days and weeks and to allow you to share in some of that in the hope that it might help you with some of your thinking and also might help you to understand some of our thinking. So um, hoping that we're not too much like the two Ronnies, um, we're going to just have a bit of a discussion and share some thoughts and ideas. So Chris, I wonder if first of all, you'd like to kick us off by saying how you felt over the last few weeks as we haven't been able to gather in church in the traditional way and what your thoughts and feelings have been. Yeah, I think it's just been so, so strange, really. Um, I think I've been very conscious of how, how grateful I am to have uh, a congregation, shall we say, in, in the form of Laura, uh, to, have, to have somebody to, to worship alongside and to worship with. Um, I was particularly conscious of that at home, but actually having shifted back into church in the last two or three weeks, um, that's been, been very helpful as well. And sharing in worship with somebody has been, been great for me. But I'm also just very conscious of the fact that I can't share it with with the other people who I've shared it mm. worship with for the last four years mm. um, and, and how different and how strange that's been. The fact that we've gone through the whole of well, nearly the whole of Lent and certainly the whole of Easter and Eastertide um, has, has just apart from the fact the time has just gone. Uh, mm. But it's just been a really strange way of celebrating the great feasts of the church yeah um, indeed. how about you yeah. um i agree with all of that really i mean it's certainly been the strangest easter that i've known um and like you i, th I think i've i've missed uh, sort of traditional ways of worshiping and certainly sort of celebrating the eucharist on my own has felt very odd because i've always held to that strong anglican belief that really the eucharist shouldn't be celebrated in the absence of a congregation because it's about the church gathering together to celebrate. Um, but on the other hand, we're not able to do that at the moment. And I think I've latched on to that notion that offering the Eucharist is the sort of highest form of prayer that we can offer. And so although it's far from ideal, offering that alone as a priest, very consciously for the people of our parishes and on their behalf, has I suppose felt like the next best thing but it has nevertheless felt very strange and still uncomfortable if I'm honest and I think the most important part of saying mass for me at the moment is right at the beginning when I, I sort of do remind myself that I'm doing this on behalf of and for the people of the benefits and I'm very much aware of thinking at that time of those who are at home um, and not able to take part and who are making a spiritual communion. Yeah. I'm just hoping that that in, in doing that, perhaps doing it at 10 o'clock, as they know that we're saying mass, they might nevertheless still feel a part of things. So, I mean, you mentioned when, when you were chatting there, I mean, you, you've actually made the decision to move back into, into church. Mm. So how different has that felt? Um, well, I mean, St. Thomas's is a massive space, whether you've got 300 people in it or three. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. we've, we've only had two. And last week, for various reasons, it was just me and the laptop. Um, and, and it is very strange. Um, I, I've moved it back up to the high altar uh, in <laughs> St. Thomas's because it, it's the best, quote, recording studio <laughs> that we've got. Uh, the, lighting, the lighting is better and, and the acoustics are, are more contained up there but you do still look beyond the laptop screen down into the nave and you're, you're just very conscious that normally there would be a number of people there sharing in worship with you and mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. probably what I, what i'm hoping like you um and relying on to a certain extent is that people are joining me in prayer from the from the from the parish from the benefice at that mm -hmm. time as is our custom 
mm -hmm. and our habit and so at least in a representative way i guess that i can can say mass like you on behalf of the benefits and for the good of its people mm. and, and yeah. at least to the glory of god yeah moving into the church has been been helpful for me um, right. i think i found in some ways um celebrating the eucharist in my study was quite charming for a few weeks <laughs> uh, it had you know it has a very different feel it, it's sort of cozy it's quite intimate which is lovely but it still felt like i was a, I was at home, um, right. yeah. even though I was in in the in the study bit, and that there was a there was a big brick building that had been consecrated for the purpose, just <laughs> half a mile away, uh, sitting not fulfilling its purpose, um, as a, yeah, as a sort of again as a representative function really of mm. of an aspect of of our faith. Right. Um, but you've yeah. been in, in a different boat. Yes, I mean, I mean, I completely understand all of that, and I, I thought long and hard about whether I wanted to go back into church or not, and decided not to for a variety of reasons. Really, I, I think first of all, I, I would have just been overwhelmed by that sort of vastness and emptiness of the building that you talk about, <laughs> and for me, I think that would have kind of amplified the strangeness of what I was mm. doing, sort of saying mass without a congregation it would have felt even more peculiar mm. than it felt and feels in the intimacy of my own study here at home so um i think that was one factor um and although at another level it was tempting to go back into church i kind of thought well in a way for me um it's the reminder of my sort of solidarity in a sense with those who are having to worship in less than ideal situations and are having to make do at home and perhaps the fact that in the past in previous lives i've, I've worked in chaplaincy and things and, and worked in situations where i haven't been involved with the parish and haven't had a church um i am probably more used to sort of celebrating at a coffee table in a lounge or whatever um and recognizing that that but the Eucharist is still the Eucharist. So mm. I think I made a decision to to stick with it, certainly for, for the time being. But I completely sort of understand and respect um, your view on that. And, mm. and again, over time, perhaps we move to different positions. Um, and that leads us on, I guess, to, to the other big issue, you know, that big question to stream or not to stream. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's been this great rush across the Church of England to sort of live stream celebrations, whether it is from living rooms or studies, mm -hmm. Some of which have been dressed up in the most baroque sort of way, it sort of looked like the grandest possible church, and some of which have been um, very simple. But um, a lot of people have been streaming live services with varying degrees of success. I think I would I would have to say, um, and we've opted not to do so. I mean, firstly, live streaming for the church itself is impossible because we haven't got wi-fi yeah. so, so that's the sort of given that that's for us non-negotiable anyway but we've also chosen even when we're both celebrating at home not to stream from home um and again i think i was conscious that my thinking there was that certainly at this end of the benefits i know that at least two-thirds of our folks don't have internet access mm. um and that's why we've been very careful, of course, to send out, as we will be doing again shortly, written resources that they can use and replicating those online. And obviously we can, there are things we can do online for those who do have the benefit of being online. I mean, someone said to me the other day, if you've got a car, um, you don't not use it because other people haven't got a car. And I think that's a very valid point. Um, but it also made me think that if you've got a car and others haven't got a car, you don't sort of sweep past them cheerily waving when they're on a long walk somewhere <laughs> and sort of rub their noses in it in a way. So, so there's a kind of, I think there's a, there's a tension there. And I felt that actually sort of streaming the Eucharist for those who've got the benefit of the, of, um, the internet, um, would even more exclude those who hadn't. Mm. And I think without sort of getting into boring details about my personal history, but some people will understand this some won't. I mean, having had experiences of discrimination and exclusion, it seems to me particularly important um, that we treat people sort of as equitably as we can. And I, I just felt uncomfortable 
about the Eucharist becoming the football, as it were, in that particular kind of issue. And I didn't want it to become contentious about, well, some people can share in an, albeit in a partial way, in a virtual way, but others can't. Mm. Um, and I know that you shared a lot of that sort of thinking and still do. Mm. Um, but having moved into church, which seems to have been quite sort of watershed for you, in, in, mm. in those terms, you've sort of moved to a different space. Um, where now you are actually recording your sort of celebrations. So I wonder if you wanted to just share something about what your thinking was there and, and where you've, why you've shifted. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it has been, been a really interesting one. I mean, I think just sort of going back to some of the live streaming stuff, one of the things I've been from the beginning quite conscious of is not doing something on a Sunday morning that can be shared. We'll yeah. come on to some of the Zoom stuff that we've been doing later. I know a lot of parishes very happily and very successfully have been been doing Zoom stuff on, on a Sunday morning and, and, and great. I think I was struck early on that anything that we could offer was probably not going to have much more added value than what the BBC are putting out on a Sunday morning. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Actually, and would probably be similar in style to a greater extent without the production values um so so i was always very keen and still am keen to encourage people to make the most of these resources while they're being put out um because it's been several years now since there was worship broadcast on a sunday morning on bbc one um so so make yeah. the most of that and, and very much encourage people in that direction um but the the other thing is there's also that sense of sort of the wider church that what we do as a parish is not the only thing that the church universal does um and so to encourage people to engage more widely with the resources that are already out there on on a sunday morning mm -hmm. um but for me recording the eucharist i think has just been a way of if people want to engage in that way they can i've, I've realized it was a bit stressful the first couple of times just <laughs> recording a eucharist and there's that Oh goodness, do I really do that with the particular twitch or do my hands end up in the wrong? <laughs> All of these sort of things that you sort of worry about as, as a curate and then yeah. quietly forget about once you sort of go up a notch, or go up a rung <laughs> on the ladder. Suddenly you're having to think yes. about it again and you find yourself watching yourself back quite intently just to make sure you haven't got any bad habits. Um, mm. But actually, once you've sort of got into that rhythm and that pattern, it's not too difficult to just to record the Eucharist as it's happening and i haven't tried to do anything particularly high flown or fancy it's just sort of the the, the basic package uh, insofar as the mass can ever be a basic package of anything as the, as the highest form of, of prayer and worship mm. um so if people are missing that and people do want to engage as a way of helping them with their their spiritual communion and engagement then i've sort of felt happy to do that i think always on the basis that recording worship and recording a eucharist is always going to be a slightly imperfect form of worship compared to gathering in the flesh and gathering mm -hmm. in real time mm -hmm. and so on but it's just in spite of my reservations i think i've just tipped over i know earlier i described it to you as a sort of theological wheel of fortune that that moment yeah. of <laughs> of uh, sort of indecision when the wheel is just doing that and you're not sure if it's going to tip yeah. over yeah. into the next one well i think for me i did just tip over uh, uh, sort of out of reservation yeah. and saying i'm not going to do this into I'll try it with reservations. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So it's it's always with that caveat that it's not quite mm. the right thing, mm -hmm. but also of just wanting to make that opportunity available for people. Yeah. If they want yeah. if they want to take it up. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I can understand that, and and I think after a lot of heart searching, as you know, I'm I'm kind of a notch behind you. I haven't sort of um, tipped over into that next stage <laughs> yet. Um, and because I, I, I think for me, the discomfort is about the fact that um, even though you know, if you live stream a Eucharist, people are gathering in a sense, they're gathering online and, and the Eucharist is about the gathering of the people. Um, that can't happen with a recorded Eucharist in terms of the Eucharist as it happens. And I think in the, in the nicest and most positive possible way that that shifts people from being a congregation slightly to be more of an audience mm. 
And I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that, because I think if that is helpful at the pastoral level to them, in terms of you know seeing that the Eucharist has been celebrated and has been celebrated in the building that they know and love and wish they were gathering in. If that's helpful, I would want to affirm and support that. So I don't I don't want to be so negative about that at all. But simply to say that for me at the moment, um, it wouldn't feel right to sort of celebrate the Eucharist on those terms because I'd be wondering what I was doing at the time. I may move on and I may tip into that next <laughs> that next stage with a wheel of fortune, who knows. Um, but of course I'm slightly older and longer in the tooth father, so it takes me a bit longer these days. <laughs> but, um, but I'm glad you've done it and you're trying it and even more glad if people are finding that, that helpful. But but I think it's it just flags up some of those complex theological struggles mm. that we've got to engage with and, and as you say, we, we can have reservations about things and it, it's about where do you where do you find the tipping point? And I think there's there's an awful lot of that going on at the moment in, in all sorts of ways. Um, so yeah. I think one thing I will but, say is is YouTube is a very good way of keeping you humble. Um, yeah. <laughs> for a whole variety of reasons because you, you do spot things that you think oh I didn't realize I do that I know um, it's all but, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but also YouTube has analytics so after a few days you can you can you see that you've had 56 views and then you dig down a bit further and you realize that a few of those have watched the video twice or yeah. uh, probably my mother um, or you <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Or you, you dig down a little bit more and you realize that actually 56 people viewed it for about 35 seconds, but only 20% of a certain percentage actually watched it from beginning to end. Um, and for that percentage, I, I'm really, really happy to do it. And I hope yeah. that that's really, really helpful. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yes, YouTube does keep you humble and just keeps you keeps you conscious of, as you say, some of, some of the issues surrounding being an audience and dipping your toe and mm. dipping your toe is fine um mm. but actually the, the realities of some of the the numbers game that some of our colleagues are playing with the online mm. stats um, I, I think we need to be cautious of and actually i, I am very very humble in that respect yeah uh, in terms of the, the realities of of the numbers yeah. game yeah yeah indeed um you mentioned in passing earlier that we've actually been using Zoom for saying morning and evening prayer, which, which of course is, is a live thing. Um, and we have also used it on one or two other occasions as we used it for celebrating Pentecost on Sunday evening and Ascension Day. Um, it was non-Eucharistic, but it was live and people did sign up and join in. And, and I know that the feedback from that has been generally very good. Um, my experience of that, I think, is is very positive. Um, as you said, we, we should beware of playing the numbers game, but if I can be permitted to do that just for a second, um, it's interesting that we, we're getting significantly more people for morning and evening prayer on Zoom than we ever did when we said it's in church. Um, and I do think maybe part of that, um, quite reasonably, is that it's easier for people to spend quarter an hour sitting at their PC and then getting back on with their life than having to drive or walk to church for a very brief service. It's actually friendlier to the environment as well if people <laughs> might be driving. Um, so I think it, it's got a lot to say for it. And that may well be, I think, one of the things that we think about in terms of the future and what else we might continue doing online um, when we emerge into what you like to call the hybrid church, which I, think, <laughs> I do think is a wonderful phrase. So like you, I hope it does catch on. Um, but I've really enjoyed that and I found that really helpful. Um, mm. I didn't think sort of what your thoughts are about all of that. I think I, I've certainly found that the Zoom platform that the best and most favourable platform of the sort of online worship that, that we're offering um, because yeah, you're, you you are gathering it in real time, um, albeit with some of the quirks of Wi-Fi signal issues and your voice suddenly slowing down yes. and <laughs> speeding up very quickly, and uh, some of the other issues. Um, and yeah. frankly, the vicarage Wi-Fi here seems to be the worst of all of our participants <laughs> at, at times. Yeah. So it's not without its frustrations, but actually, as you say, looking forward, part of me thinks. Well, if it's the choice of trekking up to All Saints on a rainy November evening 
for evening prayer to say it by myself, as is sometimes mm. the case, or staying at home with the reasonable guarantee of a couple of others joining in online, then I can, yeah, I, I've got mm. to give some serious consideration to to that. Um, mm. But I think it has, as I say, it's been a really favourable platform because it does just feel like you're part of a congregation and you've you've got the sort of the sidebar of your congregation running down one one screen as you see them staring intently at the powerpoint that you might be putting up or the words of the hymns or the songs um yeah. but it's also a good excuse and a good opportunity to try some different things liturgically as well as we've tried with ascension day and with pentecost mm. some different music um some pictures some different ways of engaging. I mean, you heard it here first, but I'm planning a Zoom cafe church uh, on the 14th of June. So we'll see how that goes as well. So I think, yeah, that, that's been a really positive thing to try. I know that for some people, Zoom has felt like a step too far for, for online platforms, but hopefully we might be able to encourage people and help them out technologically as well as theologically. Well, yeah, indeed. With, with, yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, excellent. Um, I, was, I think we're sort of drawing to a close, really. But, but mm. finally, I, I was just thinking earlier um, for myself about what were the things that have perhaps surprised me about my response to some of this stuff and some of these issues. And um, had I learned anything about myself, really? And is there anything that might shape what I do in the future? Um, and I think for me, and I know this came as a surprise to you as well about me, um, the, the sort of, there's the stuff around the theology of place. There's, there's that stuff about not needing to be in the church quite as much as I expect it to be. Yeah. Um, and that interestingly did surprise me. Um, but I think I realised that that was about a shift in my own spirituality recently, which is much more open to, you know, God being able to come to us wherever we are. Um, and also, this might be a bit contentious, I don't know, but, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I think I'd probably be feeling much more bereft of the church if I were a worshipper rather than an incumbent, because mm. um, I think when you're an incumbent, of course, the church becomes a huge responsibility <laughs> and a huge challenge. <laughs> um, and however fond one might be of it, it is also that sort of very heavy burden. And mm worshipping away from the church perhaps gives a sense, perhaps a false sense of liberation from some of that responsibility. So maybe subconsciously that, that's been a part of it. Um, but I can perfectly well understand how others are missing the church enormously and that there is still an element of that for me, but not as much as I expected there to be. Um, and I think the other thing I've realised, coming back to this theme of Corpus Christi, is that as a parish, we've never made a big thing of that, really. I think we've normally transferred it to the Sunday and um, we haven't done what many parishes do and have a, a sort of completely over the top mass and process the sacrament round outside and then with benediction and things. Um, well, actually, we have years ago but that was that was an event that was organized by the society of catholic priests rather than a sort of internal benefice thing um i have a feeling i might be more inclined to do some of those things in the future because mm -hmm. as with so many things at the moment um i've got a heightened sense of how much actually we take the eucharist for granted in the same way that we take so many things in life for granted that are suddenly not open and available to us in the same way um, and therefore when Corpus Christi gives an opportunity to really celebrate what Eucharist means to us perhaps my inclination will be to make more of that in the future I might be making a rod for my own back here and my words might come back to bite me um, but at the moment that, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Um, do you have any sort of final thoughts for us about things that have surprised you or um, I, I mean, I think one of the one of the things I, I've really sort of, excuse me, realised is about how much I value the sort of the rhythm of of the, the sort of the, the church's week and the church's year yes. and how that, that sort of daily pattern of morning and evening prayer has just really helped to give a structure um, at a time when there's no real thing as structure um, just for, for lots of people in, in different ways. And so at least even though sort of other things have been 
sort of put out of place and things feel a bit disjointed, at least with that, the Eucharist on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock is, is just a really helpful habit and a really pattern and then morning and evening prayer during the week. And then, and then even though it's online gathering with other people to do that, and there's never been a time when I've sat here on Zoom on my own to say in office, <laughs> uh, whereas in church that has been a, been a, a thing in the past. And so that's been, that's been a really, really good thing. Um, mm. The other thing I've sort of realised, you alluded to the, the issues that church buildings and, and running parishes brings, actually the fact that that has necessarily been stripped away for us it's not to say that the admin has disappeared completely but what that has done is, is opened up more opportunity for some of the pastoral work that sometimes gets gets overlooked and so it's been really nice just to catch up with people mm. and and have that sort of pastoral relationship that we don't always get opportunity for uh, mm. as priests and so that's been a really valuable part of, yeah. of a difficult time and also just to get a sense of and a different perspective on who is and isn't included on a regular basis more generally. We put a lot of effort into uh, the Holy Week and Easter resources this year and circulated them sort of as a blanket piece to everyone, actually in a way that at other Easter's I haven't done that in quite the same way. So there's some, some mm -hmm. really interesting stuff to ponder and think about how we include people uh, like that going forward. So there's, there's some really mm -hmm. interesting interesting things to ponder yeah. and, and consider going yeah. forward Absolutely. but also the lesson of not thinking too far ahead as well because we don't, <laughs> well, we don't know how yes. the government guidance let alone the church of england guidance is going to change from week to yeah. week on what we can and can't do indeed so yeah. i suppose we're, we're living in in god's time rather than the counted regular time that we like <laughs> <laughs> yeah indeed we'll probably learn a little Absolutely. bit more about that yeah yeah Thank you. So I think we've we've probably just about drawn to a close. I think if I were to to encourage you, uh, as those of you who are watching on to this this conversation, is to to thank you for your continued prayers and your support. Uh, to encourage you to to pray for us as we pray for you, and uh, to say that we are valuing sharing with worship in worship with you in in different ways, and uh, to try new things uh, and to see how they go and let's together put one foot in front of the other even though that seems very odd at times um, and to work as we've just established in God's time as much as in human time and uh, to thank you and to assure you of our prayers as well. Indeed. Okay. Good to see you Trevor, good to see you all good. and we'll good let to see you, see you again Take soon. Care. Bye.